I am uh, grateful that we have an opportunity to come together. We're going to proceed uh, with a study of the assurance of activities that surround the Day of Atonement and see how it was fulfilled in more ways than one. And the next week we'll go on to study the Feast of Tabernacles, and that will bring to a conclusion our study on the Jewish Feast. And uh, soon after that we will study some dates that are spoken of in uh, the book of Daniel, and uh, the books of Revelation and Daniel actually. And we'll study how those uh, can be and have been misinterpreted. And uh, what the books of Daniel and Revelation, we will start a study on that. But in order to prepare that study, we will start with studying what is called the uh, Olivet Discourse, which is the teachings of Jesus on the Mount of Olives about, uh, that, that are recorded in the 24th chapter of Matthew. We want to study what those last day events are and when are those events supposed to take place because the sanctuary study is related to a time frame for the coming of the kingdom of God which is then connected to the time frame of the last day events so we need to put the two together. Here are the festivals and here are the last days related to those festivals and the time frame that brings it all together. So we'll study the Feast of Tabernacles next week, bringing to a conclusion our study on the sanctuary. Then we will prepare for our study for Daniel and Revelation with an introduction through Matthew 24, we'll have several studies in Matthew 24 to see what time frame that is talking about. Why? Because that is where we are, the, the, the church was told to prepare to go away into the mountains for the time of trouble is coming. We need to understand what that time is and how that relates to the kingdom. We will then relate also to the time frame of Daniel and Revelation. Today I want to take you to the book of Luke. The Gospel of Luke. We will start at chapter 10. Does anybody know much about the book of Luke? Any guesses as to who wrote it? Yeah. Who? I have one hint. The name of the book is his name. So who wrote the book of Luke? Very good. Everybody got 100%. Okay. Did Luke write another book? Yes. And what book is that? The book of Acts. When we study the book of Acts, we can see how that is a continuation. And I sometimes think that the book of Acts should be called Second book of Luke. You know how that Corinthians, first Corinthians, second Corinthians should be second Luke. But we're going to step into that uh, book of Luke as well, the book of Acts today. Why? Because Luke starts with the birth of Jesus Christ, talks about his preparation, and that's the first. That's the first part of the book of Luke. The second part of Luke is about the ministry of Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ going up to heaven and then the book of Acts picks up with Jesus going to heaven and the work of Jesus Christ being done by his disciples and the church. So the book of Luke encapsulates all of the mission of Jesus Christ from birth until his preparation and then the second part of Luke is divided into three major parts. One basically is uh, Jesus preparing to go into the city of Jerusalem, second is to go into the cross, and the third is to go into heaven, going to the throne of God. 
And then the book of Acts starts with the beginning of the church. Chapter 10 and the book of Luke. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and, and place where he was about to go. He told them, the harvest is plentiful, the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Go, I'm sending you out like lambs among wolves. Do not take a purse or bag or sandals and do not greet anyone on the road. When you enter a house, first say peace to this house. If someone who promotes peace is there, your peace will, be, will rest on them. If not, they will return to you. Stay there, eating and drinking whatever they give you, for the worker deserves his wages. Do not move around from house to house. When you enter a town and are welcome, eat what is offered to you. Heal the sick who are there, and tell them the kingdom of God has come near to you. But when you enter a town, and are not welcome into its street, and say, even, and it's not only we're going to say, even the dust of your town will be wiped from our feet as a warning to you. Yet be sure of this, the kingdom of God has come near. I tell you, it will be more bearable on that day for Sodom than for that town. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. But it will be more bearable for Tyre and Sidon at the judgment than for you. And Capernaum, will you be lifted to the heavens? No. You will go down to Hades. Whoever listens to you listens to me. Whoever rejects you, rejects me. But whoever rejects me, rejects him who sent me. The 72 returned with joy and said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. He replied, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions, and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. However, do not rejoice that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are. That's a lot. Let's dissect that. And take a look at what that has to do with the covenant that God gave to Abraham. Right? What was the covenant that God gave to Abraham? That you will have seeds of the stars in the sky and the sand of the seas. You will have a home, a country where you will reside and you will prosper and where your seed can grow and see the success that I promise. And through you, how many nations will be saved? All nations will be saved. And who are the all nations? We got that from Genesis chapter 5 to 7, which recounts Noah and the descendants of Noah. And how many were there? 72. Then we see that God is a Sinai. Am I right? God is a Sinai. He is giving the law to Moses. And Moses is preaching. And Moses' father-in-law says, Listen, you need to get more helpers. And how many helpers does he get? He gets 70 that came into the temple. And another two that did not make it to the temple. There were how many there? 72. The 72 represents all nations. And Jewish history records... That they understand that when God gave the command in what they understood to be Hebrew, they, there were as many as 72 languages that were interpreted by the Word of God. So that indicated that the Word of God was going to all the world. <coughs> now, 
After that, God made another promise, and that was to who? To David to say that through you will come a king whose throne will last for how long? Forever. And that will come from the town of Bethlehem. Right? Yeah. This is Jesus himself. What is he telling the disciples? He chose how many? Twelve? He chose how many? Seventy-two. What does that seventy-two relate to? All nations. We see that in the covenant. That 72 relates to all 72. And what does he tell them? He says, you go there and you look for additional workers. You go there and you look for additional workers. He is not at this time telling them to go and prepare for the entire world, but to look for others that may join them in the work. He says, ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest fields. Look for more. When a king was going to attend another country or a city, he would send out heralds. He would send out people to go in advance and say that in 30 days the king is going to be here. And what did the people do? They cleaned up their villages and their towns, cleaned up the roads, organized everything, made sure that they were prepared for the coming of the king. By sending out a herald to announce his coming, he is acknowledging, he's beginning to acknowledge now in chapter 10 of Luke, that he is the king. He doesn't here call himself the king, but he does say something else. Let me take you to verse 9. Heal the sick who are there and tell them the kingdom of God has come near to you. Get it? The kingdom of God has come near to you. What kind of a kingdom can exist without a king? Can you have a kingdom without a king? What is a kingdom? A kingdom is a territory controlled and ruled by a king. So if the kingdom is nearby, there has to be a king nearby that is preparing to come. And he says, if they accept you, great. But if they don't, just warn them. And the warning throughout this passage is to repent to confess and prepare for the coming of the king. Whoever listens to you, listens to me. Whoever rejects you, rejects me. But whoever rejects me, rejects him who sent me. Now, we have to ask the question, is what is this rejection all about? Who is Jesus? He says, if he rejects me, he rejects he who sent me. But who in this plan of salvation is Jesus Christ? Before he becomes a king. <coughs> in the gospel, as we studied in the sanctuary, who is Jesus Christ? He is the Lamb. He is the sacrifice. He is the one who lived a perfect life. It is through His life that I go to God and gain redemption. It is not through my life. It is through His death 
that I die. It is through his resurrection that I am resurrected. So when I accept Jesus Christ, I accept his life as mine, his death as mine, his resurrection as mine. And then when God sees me, he doesn't see me, he sees who? He sees Jesus Christ. So, the one who rejects Jesus Christ is that person who rejects the gospel. A person who persists that God can forgive me, but I must live righteously because I can only depend on my own good works and God expects me to be righteous. That person rejects Jesus Christ and his sacrifice and his perfect life and his resurrection. Jesus here says clearly, whoever listens to you, in other words, who are they? They are the ones who are preaching a certain message. I'm going to come to that message in just a little while. The 72 returned with joy and said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. How come they don't come back and say, Jesus, we can heal, or that we can raise the dead, or that we can... Uh, it's still the waters in the, in the sea. You know what? All of that had been done before. You go through the Old Testament, and you go through a list of all the miracles. Do we see raising the dead? The biggest miracle is what? Raising the dead. Do we see anywhere the raising of the dead in the Old Testament? Do we? Sure we do. Sure we do. Do we see healing of the sick? Of course we do. Do we see nature being overridden in the Old Testament? Sure we do. We see it all. But where do we see demons being controlled by the prophets? Never. 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 It is only here. Now that Jesus is here on earth and he gives authority to his disciples. This is a big deal. And why is that a big deal here? Let me tell you. Keep reading. Verse 18. He replied, when they said to Jesus, let even the demons submit to us in your name. Jesus replied, I saw Satan fall like what? Lightning from heaven. I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. However, I'm going to come back to the however. So what does Jesus say? I have given you power over the enemy, and I have seen Satan fall. Jesus is projecting forward that Satan will no longer have access to heaven. Where is heaven? The throne of God. Now I ask you, do we see anywhere in the Bible that after Adam and Eve, and after Adam came to the Garden of Eden, after Satan came to the Garden of Eden, that Satan still had access to heaven? Did Satan have access to heaven? Yes. How do we know? We see it in Job, very clearly. And what does it say to God? I run to and for. That means that Nobody can control me. Nobody can stop me on earth. That's mine. I am the king of this world. Now, Jesus said, the kingdom is near. Which means his days are numbered. Because there will be a new kingdom and there will be a new king 
and Satan will be thrown down. I ask you, where did sin begin? How many want to answer that question? Where did sin begin? Where? In heaven. It began in heaven. So if the Bible says that the sanctuary will be cleansed, and we have a sanctuary here on earth, which is cleansed on the day of atonement by the high priest, out of the sanctuary in heaven, because the sanctuary on earth is only a type of the sanctuary in heaven. There was sin in heaven. Satan was thrown out. But the action of sin started there. And Satan still had access to that. <clears throat> Something to think about. Jesus said that I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. This is different than Satan coming and going and claiming this earth as his because the people here chose him. In this case, he's being booted out of heaven because this kingdom of God is going to come to this world with a new king. Take note. However, do not rejoice that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Take very, very, very close notice of this. For those that judge and focus on their life as Christian believers, on miracles, or on how they can control demons, Jesus says, that's not it. What is important is not that you control demons, but that your names are written in heaven. Where in heaven are the names going to be written? On the wall somewhere, like graffiti? The Bible tells us they will be in the book of life. It doesn't say that rejoice that your names may be written. Now we don't know how the judgment is going to go. He doesn't say that. He says you have believed and you have accepted. Therefore your names are written in the book in heaven. Not that it's going to be written at a later date, 1800 years. That is reason to rejoice. Amen. Go to chap uh, chapter 1 of the book of Acts. The book of Acts, for those of you that don't know, comes right after Revelation. Is that right? Okay, everybody got it. The book of Acts. This is Luke writing. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven. To do that, let's go back to Luke and look at the last chapter and the last few verses. We're going to come back to Acts. We're going to flip back and forth for a little while. Chapter 24, verse 44. This is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me. Where? In the law of Moses the prophets, and the psalms. Who is this speaking? Jesus is talking to the disciples, saying, 
everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scripture. He told them, this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. And repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of all these things. I'm going to send you what my, I'm going to send you what my father has promised. But stay in the city until you have been clothed with power on high. When he had led them out to the vicinity of Bethany, he lifted up his hands and blessed them. While he was blessing them, he left them and was taken up into heaven. Then they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem in great joy, and they stayed continually at the temple praising God. Take note. This is what is written, verse 46. The Messiah will suffer. <coughs> He will rise from the dead on the third day and repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in His name to how many nations? All nations. To all nations. That is the covenant to Abraham and to Moses and to Samuel. That I will be the Messiah, and I am the Messiah, and repentance will be preached to all nations. Not just the Jews. Not just the Jews. But wait until you get the power. And how are you going to get the power? When I go there, I am going to send you what my Father has promised. So who is doing the sending? Who is doing the sending? God the Father? Who is, who is sending the, the, the Spirit? Jesus Christ. And where is He getting that power from? From God. So where does He have to be in order to get that power to send? He's going to go to God. And acknowledge that everything that God wanted Him to do was done and complete. And the only way the power could come is if the forgiveness of sins, as he just promised here, was accepted. And if it wasn't accepted, if his sacrifice wasn't accepted, he could not go to the throne and send the power. And so the evidence of... Before he came back down. <clears throat> 40 days. And on the 40th day, he came back and he said that God had atoned their sin. We see here, the ascension of Jesus Christ is to the throne of God. To the throne of God. Jesus didn't tell the 72 disciples in Luke chapter 10 to go because I'm going to go around this temple or around the sanctuary or into the holy place or to the altar and wait over there or I'm going to wait in the holy place until God moves from the holy place to the most holy place. He didn't say any of that. He said the kingdom is at hand. If the kingdom is at hand, the king is at hand. Without the king, there can be no kingdom. Listen to this. Then, on one occasion while he was eating, with them he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? Now, you realize that at this time Israel had no king. There was no king in Israel. So they thought Jesus was going to become a king of that temporal Israel, the earthly Israel. And Jesus said, it's not for me to figure out the politics of this world. Here it is, verse 7. 
It is not for you to know the times and days the Father has set by His own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to what? To the ends of the earth. What Jesus here responds to, they're asking questions about the nation of Israel. Whether Israel itself would be restored with a king. And he answers and he says, what? Well, don't worry about the political business. Don't worry about this earth. Instead, become witnesses of my work and my gospel to Jerusalem first, and then to Judea and Samaria, and then to the ends of the earth. Why the ends of the earth? Because this is the fulfillment of the covenant that God made with Abraham, saying, through you, all nations will be saved. All nations will be saved. After this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky, and he was going, as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? The same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. What is the activity that takes place? What is the next action that takes place with regard to our salvation? The action currently taking place is that he is going up to heaven. And we know he is going up to heaven to be seated at the right hand of God. And the next action that takes place with regard to our salvation is his coming back. Just the way we saw him. It's not complicated. It's very clear. I'm going to continue reading, but I'm going to go into the sermon of Peter. Chapter 2. Peter is with the disciples. They've been filled by the Holy Spirit. They have started to preach in their own language and everybody's understanding them in their own language. There's nobody here that is speaking any language that is not understood. Then Peter stood up among the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews, and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and the signs of the earth below. Blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be what? Saved. This is the sermon that Peter is preaching. And how many were baptized on that day? 3,000. <laughs> and what were the 3,000 baptized into? A hope that some judgment, when it starts in heaven in 18 centuries, that they will be accepted. Is that what? <laughs> they were accepted then and there. Peter says this is the fulfillment of the prophecy of Joel. And what is the prophecy of Joel? Read verse 17 again. In what days? In what days? In the last days. When did the last days begin? The last days are not something that's way ahead of us. Peter tells us the last days was then, after the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the ascension of Jesus Christ, it was the last days beginning. Why? The history of the world is divided basically into four. One is before sin. Then there's after sin. 
until Jesus comes. Then, when Jesus comes, starts the last days after his ascension, and it ends in the fourth, which is the new heaven and the new earth. New heaven and the new earth. The last days began, not according to me, not according to some Bible commentary, not according to some prophet, according to the Bible, according to the Apostle Peter, this was the last day when Peter was teaching. And he said, and everyone who does what? Everyone who lives a righteous life. Read with me verse 21 of Acts chapter 2. <clears throat> and tell me if I'm right or wrong. And everyone who keeps the commandments in the name of the Lord will be saved. Is that what it says? What does it say? Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Is that a big difference? There's nothing of mine in my salvation. It is all Jesus Christ. Amen. It is all Jesus Christ. Fellow Israelites, verse 29, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died. I'm going to go back a little bit. Verse 25. This is Peter quoting David. I saw the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest at home. Because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead. You will not let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the paths of life. You fill, you will fill me with joy. Where? In, presence. In your presence. This is the prophecy of David that Peter says is fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And how is it fulfilled in Jesus Christ? Luke records it in the book of Acts. It is fulfilled because Jesus ended up in the presence of God. And where is God? He's in the most holy place. Fellow Israelites, verse 29. I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried. And his tomb is here to this day. But he was a prophet. And knew that God had promised him on oath that he would place one. And we all are witnesses of this. Verse 33, read it carefully and make sure it is imprinted in your mind. Speaking about Jesus, exalted to the right hand of God. He has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and it has poured out what you now see and hear. Get it? What did Jesus say? That I will send you the Holy Spirit from whom? From God. How is he going to get it from God? When God approves of his life, death, and resurrection. And seats him on the right hand and accepts Jesus Christ on behalf of all humanity. And when that happens, then Jesus said, I will send you the Holy Spirit. Because that happened. Therefore, when the Holy Spirit was there. And we were seeing the fulfillment of Pentecost by the Holy Spirit. That was the evidence that Jesus was sitting in the most holy place with God. And don't let anybody tell you different than the Word of God. Read it again, verse 33. Exalted to the right hand of God. So when Jesus went up to heaven, where did he go? The holy place or the most holy place? The most holy place. Exalted to the right hand of God. He has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit. And He has poured it out so we can now see it here. If He didn't receive it from the Father, how could He be sent? What is there to be hated? What is there to be confused about? David did not ascend into heaven. And yet he said, The Lord said to my Lord, 
Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. What is the next action? Jesus is sitting at the right hand of God. And what is the next activity to take place now? For Jesus to come back and the enemies of God to be trampled underfoot of the conquering king. Conquering king. A sanctuary in heaven was cleansed when Jesus went up. And the fulfillment of the vision that Jesus had in Luke chapter 10, that I saw Satan being thrown from heaven like lightning. Why thrown from heaven like lightning? Because he had no more access to heaven. That was the end of the access of Satan to heaven. No more sin. And Jesus Satan had desired to be in the sanctuary. We know that. The book of Revelation tells us that. He had desired to be in the sanctuary. In the north gate. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. Does it say that Jesus will become Lord? How does it become Lord? How does it become King? By being on the throne. Go to 2 Samuel chapter 7. 2 Samuel chapter 7. In our study of the covenants, we have looked at this covenant, covenant with David. Let's read this. Covenant of David, there was one that clarified how the covenant with Abraham will be fulfilled. Chapter 7, and read with me verse 11. And have done ever since time, the time I have won the leaders over my people. I will give you rest from all your enemies. The Lord declares to you that the Lord himself will establish a house for you. When your days are over and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you. Now notice, it doesn't say offspring, it's plural. I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, your own flesh and blood. And I will establish his what? Kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name. And I will establish the throne of his kingdom for how long? Forever. I will be his father and he will be my son. When he does wrong, I will punish him with a rod, wielded by men with floggings and inflicted by human hands. But my love will never be taken away from him as I took it away from Saul, whom I removed from before you. Your house and your kingdom will endure for Allah forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. Does God change his covenant? Does God neglect his covenant? Does God break his covenant? No. This covenant that God made to clarify the covenant that he made with Abraham, which was fulfilled through Moses, until this time, through this uh, through the seed of David, now comes to be fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And we are told by Luke in the sermon of Peter, verse 33 of Acts chapter 2, exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and what you hear. For David did not ascend to heaven, 
And yet, he said, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I meet Jesus in the last days. We end up not too late after this on the question of the good subject. Later on, we find Jesus tells them the story of the good Samaritan. And what is that about? A, fair, a, a scribe, a lawyer, comes to Jesus. What must I do to inherit a life? And Jesus says, you know the law. You know the law. Why do you ask me? And he says, what is written? And he says that love God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, and your neighbor as herself. This is verse 30, chapter 10. This is very important to take note of this parable. I'll tell you why. Guys, this parable brings home to us the kind of transformation that should take place when you're filled with the Holy Spirit. This is what should happen. That's why Luke talks about all those uh, the, the prophecies being fulfilled. And as the prophecies are fulfilled, then he says what? The parable here, the story. And here the story that Jesus tells him. is what about he says, love your neighbor as yourself. And he says, who is my neighbor? Who is my neighbor? And Jesus begins to answer that. Now I want to ask you guys a question. In this story, who is the neighbor? Who is the neighbor? Don't be, don't be bashful. Who is the, who's the neighbor? My friend, my family, my who? Who? Sorry? Yeah, brothers and sisters, yes. In this story, in the story of the Good Samaritan, who is the good neighbor? Who is the neighbor? No, not a good neighbor. Who's the neighbor? He's a good Samaritan, sorry. But the question is asked, who is my neighbor? And an answer is given. So as far as you know, who does Jesus declare to be the neighbor? So in our life, when we go about, who is the neighbor? We've always been told that the neighbor that Jesus is talking about is the person who has been robbed and stolen from. So that neighbor who has been stolen from is our neighbor. Therefore, we should be good to all those around us. Isn't that what we've been taught? Am I right or am I wrong? Did anybody read this differently? Now read what Jesus said. Pay close attention. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? What did Jesus say? To choose the neighbor from the three. The priest, the Levite, and the Samaritan. Out of those three, which was the neighbor? The Samaritan. So it's not talking about the other person. Jesus said here, they, the expert in the law said, the one who had mercy on him. So who is this parable about? It's not about the dude who got robbed. It's about the guy who helped him. It's about us. It's about us. Who is the neighbor? So the transformation that comes into our life. The question is asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, there are those who will tell you, if you meticulously keep all the Ten Commandments, or all 613 commandments, did the priest keep all the commandments? More likely than you and I. I bet you he was a better Sabbath keeper than all of you. Or me. 
He was a beautiful creature. He didn't even want to go near that guy because he knew if he did, he was going to make himself a king. The salvation, eternal life, is found in the transformation of our heart. Where even a Samaritan, Samaritans were called stones and dogs. Stones because they were considered stupid. Dogs they were considered unclean. And here, the title of the story is called the Good Samaritan. What does that suggest? It doesn't come about the goodness. It's a commentary on what they thought of the Samaritans. The Samaritans were all bad, but this one was good. Mm. The transformation that comes by the power of the Holy Spirit is to give up self and pride. And the same thing happened in chapter 2 and 3 of the book of, uh, the book of Acts. What happens when the Holy Spirit comes? What do people do with all their money? They sell all their homes and their property and put the money in the bank to make sure that they have a good retirement. Is that right? They take everything they had and they sell it. So all may be able to use it for their, as they require. That is the transformative life of a follower of Jesus. And that is what points to my weakness when I cannot do it. And send me running to Jesus Christ, that he may come and live in my heart. Just as at Pentecost in Sinai, the Ten Commandments came on the tablets. But at the Pentecost in Acts, the commandments of God were written where? In the heart, like Jeremiah 31 tells. And when the commandments are written on the heart, what comes out of our lives is love and action. That is the question. Jesus paid everything for us. Isaiah chapter 1 verse 18. Though our sins be as scarlet. It doesn't say that we have no sin. Though your sins be as scarlet. They will be as white as Though they be red like crimson, they will be as wool. And how is that? By believing. By believing and accepting Jesus Christ as our Savior. That we accept His birth, His death, His resurrection, His ascension, and His sitting at the right hand hand of God. Any preaching that tells you that Jesus did not go directly into the most holy place is not from God. It's not from God. And if it's not from God, you've got to wonder where it's from. It diminishes the gospel. It reduces the work of Jesus Christ. It tears apart the gospel. The Apostle Paul in Galatians chapter 2 and 1, the 1 and 2, he says what? If you accept any other gospel than this, it is no gospel at all. Even if you hear it from even angels, ignore it. For cursed is anybody who changes the gospel. The gospel of Jesus Christ is given to us that we may be able to take it to others and invite people to join us to finish the harvest. We're looking for those that may harvest with us. We're looking for workers, not those that want to come and sit in a comfortable place, but those that want to do the work. It is my hope one, that as we study God's Word, that each study here every week prompts each of you to go home and examine everything that we have said. Don't take my word for it. Go back and examine it against the entire Bible. Knowing that all interpretation must fit into the plan of salvation and the covenant that God gave to Abraham, Moses, and David.
God bless you all. Pray for you as you pray for me. Amen.